Welcome back, everyone, to Point of Sale, the show where we break down great retailers and, of course, the data and technology that move their supply chains. Now, of course, everyone, this is a community, not just a number one podcast for you out there. Uh, head to FreightWaves.com, click on newsletters at the top of the page, make sure that you join our community today. All you got to do is click Point of Sale, enter your email in there, and we're ready to go. Uh, be in part of our community. You'll get, of course, a weekly podcast along with a weekly newsletter that breaks down a bunch of interesting topics and headlines from the past week in retail. And we talk everything from uh, point of sale systems, go figure, to their uh, yard management software, kind of like we're going to talk about later today, uh, and all different types of areas as well. So make sure you go check that out. Again, that's greatways.com slash newsletters or greatways.com slash POS. Either way, they'll get you there and make sure you go ahead and, and add that. Now, uh, we are on YouTube now, so make sure when you head over to FreightWaves uh, YouTube page in order to watch this, or uh, if you're watching this on our channel now, click on our subscribe button on YouTube so that you get updates when new episodes appear as well. If you're looking to see some of our past episodes, click on playlist and you'll see our show playlist for you too. So make sure you do all that. And if you're listening to this uh, as well from a podcast, uh, any type of podcast uh, company or site will work for you. Make sure you subscribe to those as well. So again, you get updates when we have new episodes coming your way. Now, today we're going to talk about a couple of areas, uh, which will link together interestingly enough as well. For, so first of all, uh, we're going to start by talking about the consumer, right? At the end of the day, uh, great retailers can have the best technology and supply chains behind them. But if we don't actually have consumers coming to uh, their websites, to their stores, et cetera, buying things, well, it's not really the best environment, is it? We could say that. So that being said, I wanted to dive into an area that's going to really impact our retail companies in October, and that is the good old student loans. Now, thank God uh, by myself, I've actually taken care of mine. So it's nothing that I ha truly have to worry about. But if you are a merchant out there, if you sell honestly anything down to consulting services, uh, October is going to be a point where we see a lot of change in the e-commerce retailing uh, sales, any type of sales environment. Uh, we have a large percentage of our uh, country that is uh, hasn't been paying loans and will be behind on loans when that October date hits. Now, there are some uh, speculation out there that there'll be maybe some type of program that allows borrowers to pay back or at least get back to the regular payments a little bit more slowly. But let's just pretend in this scenario that October 1st, we see a huge demographic of our industry or our of our uh, consumers struggling to pay bills, let alone uh, spend more outside of their their normal uh, home bills as well. So on t in total, we're going to go over an interesting survey from earnest.com. Uh, and speaking of the actual loan pairs, now, April 2020, we all remember that great month. Most of us were locked down in our house. And that's when a number of borrowers got the opportunity to, uh, of course, delay their loan payments. Now, at that time, about April 2020-ish, there was about 40% drop in loan payers. We're going to be talking about a number, uh, three different groups here. We're going to be talking about those who have avoided student loans due to the COVID uh, and various regulations, to those who continue to spend during that time or continue to pay back their loans during that time, right? So uh, people who said, okay, well, I'm going to still pay back because I can, I can afford it, and they, I don't want to delay. And then three... No, uh, an unborrower, someone who didn't have to pay student loans before or now or in the, in the future as well. So at that time in April 2020, 40% again of loan payers had dropped, uh, dropped paying their loans. And by June actually of 2023, so this past month, over 70% of loan payers had stopped paying their loans. So it got significantly worse. It, it makes sense. We've seen some issues right with our economy and people are considering where that money's going. So we're in this position today. Now, if we can bring up the payments chart, uh, you can really visualize this. Now, what I want to really point out in this is not only did we see this huge drop in payers, 
up. We also saw, right, and we see this in the economy today, the dollar is is has gone up. Look back one slide for me, my bad. Uh, so when we first saw that drop in payments, right, uh, we were uh, somewhere around 284, or sorry, by 2020, we would have been $297, right? We initially saw that drop. Now, since then, the average payment has gone up all the way to $435. So not only in October, we'll be entering back into a space where the average person owes three hundred, but likely the average person is going to owe more closer to $500 a month. So already off to a bad start when we consider what's coming. Now, uh, the borrowers in particular out, actually outspent their peers in 2020. So of those three groups, the ones who had stopped paying their loans had outspent not only the, those who continued to pay their loans, but those who were not borrowing. But that has split. So I guess that's positive news. Borrowers are understanding their payments are going to turn back on. So they slowly brought down their uh, their their spending. Now, uh, where was this money spent? Because I think this is the biggest issue that we really need to look at, right? Whether you are in these industries, whether you are investing in these industries or even working in these industries, uh, potentially we see layoffs already, but we might start to see a little bit more. So let's start off with travel. Uh, overall, those who had borrowed and stopped making their payments, so the COVID uh, delinquency, you could say, uh, 5 to 15% of total merchants saw that spending in travel alone. So uh, to break it down, Frontier Airlines saw borrowers outspend non-borrowers borrowers by 11%. Alaska Airlines and United saw about a 7% difference between the two. And Airbnb over the last couple of years have seen 11% more spending from borrowers who have been avoiding payment compared to the other two groups. So those ones in particular are, are going to be slightly in trouble. We'll we'll talk about, I'll, there's another chart I'll bring up here in a second that I think will visualize this a little bit more, but I want to go through this data first. Uh, now, home home spending, so, uh, you know, furniture, et cetera, Ikea, Ashley, Home Goods, Wayfair, Lowe's, all saw about 10% more spending from those borrowers uh, than the ones who had either continued to pay or never had loans to begin with. But Peloton, of course, saw 13% more spending. Sherwin-Williams saw 6%. If I'm not going to spend money on my loans, hey, at least I'll improve my house. That's a, not a terrible way to make that, that purchase, uh, but it was there. And then last but not least, apparel and department stores. So on average, they saw about 10%. An average apparel uh, store department saw, saw 10% more spending from loan borrowers who held off on payments. Old Navy in particular saw 14%. Nordstrom, and not the Nordstrom Rack, the Nordstrom regular Nordstrom saw 8% more. And now I want to bring up this chart really quick to really kind of explain those that we need to walk. Because this is going to be including spending of those who also didn't borrow and continue to pay. So when we look at this chart, you can see in the middle, it's it's there's like a cross section, right? So the ones that are in the darker purple are the ones that are going to be most affected when we get October. Now, probably like Grace, you just said that traveling now, Delta saw more spending by uh, borrowers. Uh, yes, I did say that. But what is nice, and if you see Delta, they're all the way over on the right side of the chart near the bottom. They're a little bit more protected. They're more protected because everyone spent more money at travel. So they're not just going to be losing their number one uh, purchase purchaser or consumer. They still have a lot more to make up for. And honestly, you see more and more spending on travel as people are watching their, their expenses. Uh, they're spending more on traveling to locations. That's why you see Spirit, Hotels.com, Marriott, JetBlue. Pretty much every travel company is in that bottom right sector. Those are this. Those are the companies that are most likely to uh, make it out uh, out of this. Uh, I guess borrowing situation a little bit more protected, especially as far right as you get. And again, the ones that you're gonna really need to watch in Yikes to Peloton. I guess we're all like. I guess every borrower said, hey, if I'm not going to, to actually put money towards my loans, I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to get fit because Peloton is probably the one that you want to watch the most. Shipped, right? So for everyone that doesn't know, Shipped is a company that helps retailers deliver. Uh, that is another one that's exposed heavily to the consumer. So 
Uh, again, if we can bring up that chart just really quick for me, uh, you'll see here the ones in the purple or that pinkish color, you're going to want to watch out for. If you have investments in them, you might see some loss in it on, on October. If you're working with them, uh, poor little Caesars, uh, <laughs> Detroit company right there, uh, then you're going to you know, really make sure that you have a, a good meeting with where you're your job is going because those are the ones that are going to be really impacted the most. And basically anyone in near that center of the, the four squares, you really want to watch for as well. Uh, so that gives you an idea of where exactly to watch if you are uh, working for these companies, if you're investing in them, or if you just have interest in them as well. Those are the ones that we need to watch the most. Uh, and as, like I said, there are talks of possible like plans to get people back into paying their own. So it might not be specifically October, but when we talk about shipping and exactly how much volume is going to be out there, uh, there's, it looks like a number of uh, companies and retailers in particular, geez, Old Navy for one, that's uh, definitely one to watch. Peloton, uh, good luck. We'll see exactly how that, that goes as well. And now I want to get into our main topic today, which we actually have a company friend of the show, C Solutions, back with us. Uh, in the second year, I'll get into it. But I wanted to touch on uh, something that we talked about actually in March. Uh, the retail, uh, the National Retail Federation put out a survey uh, based off of theft. Now, uh, we talked about there's over $100 billion in theft this past year. Um, more retailers are finding that it's becoming more organized and aggressive, an increase of 26.5% concern for most retailers. 52.4% have increased their budget to make sure that they're slowing theft and that they are uh, have better security within their supply chains. And what's interesting, too, is that 68.5% of retailers said that security was a, a, a main point uh, of concern, especially from distribution centers to stores. And actually, they also found 53% of those retailers that that was the most challenging. So what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that companies and retailers, you know, they're going to look at various parts of their supply chain and make sure that they're safe and aren't going to be impacted for anything from just security risks to cybersecurity to confidentiality. 33% of retailers in the last 12 months have ex experienced some type of breach in the security of their supply chain. And so I think what's really exciting is that uh, C3 Solutions has actually just been certified for ISO uh, 27001 certification, which for those wondering means that you're focused and have secured a security management system to preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information uh, within that aspect of, for instance, this one yard management tools and doc scheduling tools as well. So uh, we're going to talk about that and uh, even more so just an emphasis on what retailers are looking for, what yards and uh, logistics providers are looking for in order to secure themselves for the future. Uh, with us is Vice President of Business Development and Customer Experiment Experience, Neil McAvoy. Thank you so much for uh, joining me once again. Uh, pleasure. Very nice to uh, speak to you today. Yeah, I'm excited. I was happy to see that you guys got this certification. I know you're focused on that customer experience and I'd love to hear about why that certification was so important for C3 to uh, achieve in order to provide you know, better trust with your uh, c customers as well. I think initially uh, it's always been something that C3 has had ingrained in its culture is to always improve our processes and be a you know, better uh, and more uh, customer-focused organization. But in real honest terms, it's a standard that our customers have asked for again and again. So being secure with information, with security, uh, making sure we have the best and most robust infrastructure, best IT. Um, you know, as we're a cloud-based uh, software provider, you know, we are absolutely reliant on our uh, information, our data, uh, and our infrastructure. So it's something that customers have asked for, you know, from a point of when we're selling a product to a prospect who is not yet a customer or to guys that are, you know, with us for a few years are uh, just understanding a little bit more about what we do and wanting to maybe uh, understand how we uh, handle our data, how we operate uh, their data, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pushed from the client perspectives all the time. And, you know, also as a byproduct, it's just meant that we've been a lot more systematic, a lot more thorough, 
and a lot more uh, process driven when we've been handling all these different subsections to uh, improve our overall uh, behavior and overall uh, sort of um, strategy with, with regards to all things information security. I, I love that. Every time I've had you guys on this show, there's always some type of critical need that you're focused on with your, your customers. I, I'd love to hear from your perspective, especially in your role, right? How do you go about uh, creating a, a process to figure out the customer's pain points, challenges, and and how do you make sure that's driven in your in your product development as well? That's a really good question. Um, I, I mean, it, it's kind of in multi areas, really, in all areas of the business, but it starts in the process of the sale. So when we get uh, talking to a new possible client, we want to know straight away first: does our product do what you want? You know, do do what it wants them to do, because then it's kind of we're making sure we're in the right ballpark and we're in that uh, the area to help them. But then we understand not just you know giving them something that they think looks cool and shiny and uh, cutting edge, but something that absolutely solves the pain points, problems, challenges, strategic endeavors. Um, you know, in a way that's understandable to the user you don't have to have a computer science degree to use our software um so from the point at which we start conversations then the baton is passed to our implementation team and these guys need to know a lot more sort of forensic granular detail on exactly what the processes are of a business how they you know get information from their shippers from their customers how they handle their data and their um, interactions when you know we reach a site, could be a distribution center, could be a depot. Um, so all along that path, we're always trying to understand what exactly are we looking to solve, not just you know trying to make a square peg fitting in a round hole because that's the software we have. We always try to tailor it to the client's needs, and a lot of the time those needs are around the challenges and pain points they have on a day-to-day basis. Then we have a really interesting and core cool thing within C3. Uh, kind of roadmap committee. So we have various different uh, touch points from around the business that sit with our lead developers and the CTO and our CEO. And we talk really about what is, uh, you know, what are our clients' prospects uh, looking for? You know, what do they want the system to do that maybe it doesn't do today? And also what else is out there in the cutting edge of technology? You know, AI now is very interesting and on everybody's uh, agendas. But, you know, many different times in, in, in the sort of history of, of technology, new things uh, come out. And it's, you know, our job to make sure that we're using the very best technology to produce the very best solutions for our customer at all points. So, you know, that's how we keep the conversations going. That's how we evolve in an organic way, uh, you know, through multiple people within our organization, having it ingrained. And it's just a cultural thing that we, we kind of live by day to day. And I think our customers appreciate that. And you know, a lot of our customers, if not all of our customers, are doing the same thing in their own in their own uh, sectors. I I love that you basically are, are showcasing the importance, right, of the onboarding experience and creating a partnership. It's so interesting that as many kind of like freight tech companies I talk to, the ones that I've seen maybe struggle in their growth, kind of they they lock down the sale first, right? They don't really have that discussion. Or that roadmap community, I love that that phrase, that gets you to the solution that you're truly looking for. And I think when you talk about especially yard management or docs, it, we had, we're talking different experiences based on what type of product, right? Where you're located, uh, so many different concerns. Uh, when you're talking with customers, what do you find is like their biggest pain points today that you're helping solve? And what what type of pain points take a little bit more uh, group work or are more steering with right within that committee to make sure that value is found? I think um, some of the obvious things or the common ones anyway are customers are losing a lot of money by not having a robust digital system that captures events. So they're losing money with driver detention fees because they don't really have a schedule. Um, they're missing product because they're turnaround times are delayed because of poor processes. Uh, they find that they have a lot of stress with their personnel because, um, you know, they, they, they end up in a call center type scenario when their job is just to plan or to, to run a good Zen operation. Um, you know, so we, we, we deal with those kind of things a lot. And, and often the way we tailor our product is different for every client, but the same overarching solutions are, are, are present when we, when we configure our system 
uh, with our clients' um, processes and their, and their goals. The thing to answer the second part of your question, that's maybe a little bit more difficult and more nuanced, uh, is often the overall change management. So what we are very good at, we are experienced at, that maybe some of the other uh, suppliers miss, is that just giving someone a product, uh, whether it's a software system or some hardware or whatever, um, you know, and, and we deal in software, cloud-based software, um, we understand that there's many different people along the chain from, you know, uh, your customer to uh, suppliers to the IT function within a business. You know, some customers have third parties that run their projects. You know, there's ma many different things that will need to happen from the day that we start a project right through to going completely live and using the system that allow you to automate, improve. So managing that with best practices, experience, and just a little bit of know-how from us means that that's a much easier, less stressful process at our client. And, um, you know, we learn some stuff too. Every project, we we have a kind of post-mortem wash-up where we always look at how we did and, and what we can learn from every new opportunity. And, and we, you know, we're very lucky that we have customers all around the globe. So, you know, even in a country the size of Canada or America, there's multiple different, um, you know, geographies, time zones and everything. But, you know, we, we deal in, uh, you know, in, in around the world and you learn a little bit, not just the language, um, not just about the different expectations, but just, you know, the, the different cultures around the world that, that, that have uh, you know, similar stresses, but different ways to handle it. So our change management process is ingrained in our product um, and ingrained in our, uh, I guess, the way we roll it out, our methodology to implement projects. I love that. Yeah, change management, again, it goes ties in the hand in hand in that like steering committee that you're talking about as well. It's not only about coming together, that teamwork and, and solving the problem, uh, but you have to work hand in hand, right, with your actual customer to make sure that one, it's being uh, done, used, and utilized correctly, you could say, but also built with with their processes in mind as well. So it's uh, it's definitely a huge collaboration and. I'm happy that, uh, again, that you guys have continued to focus on the customer experience and what their needs are. Like I said, there's been, especially security fraud-wise, not only have we seen it in retail, but even on the truckload side, we continue to talk about fraud and double brokering and uh, just bad players in the space that are looking to come in and uh, take here and there from various parts. And again, like we said, a big part of that is, is kind of watching over these uh, distribution centers and these these yards and and when people are working off Excel easily kind of getting their way in there and and picking up something that shouldn't be so I'm really happy to have you on uh, to to wrap this up we have a minute or so here uh, and Neil what are you focused on in the future where are some big areas that we can see some more product development and uh, from C read for the rest of the year uh, well, we, we've we've recently launched our driver application, which is called C3 Hive, and and, and basically that's our, uh, I guess, our move into our you know our yard management pro product and our uh, dump scheduling product both kind of control everything from a planning perspective and an execution perspective on the sites of our clients. The C3 Hive application is every, you know between sites, it's on the road, it's direct communications with drivers. Um, and it's something that's kind of going to, you know, we, we already see this happening in, in a couple of our existing clients where it's going to re revolutionize the, uh, the experience of the driver now interacting directly with C3. Uh, you know, whether it's understanding where your driver's at, it's uh, making sure your driver's on time to collect their outbound because they've dropped an inbound, or just uh, giving the business users who use C3 a much better idea of what's happening in terms of where am I collection? Okay, it might be scheduled for 4 p.m., uh, you know, but where is it? Is the ETA changed? Uh, just allowing a really seamless automated check-in process with a QR code, or you know, with a driver smartphone, without paperwork, without leaving your truck, without any interaction unless the interaction is necessary. So that's the thing that's really interesting for us at the moment, and our clients are really uh, excited about uh, how Hive could help their, you know, not just their overall you know, budget uh, return on investment but how their drivers are going to experience a much better, much more user-friendly, much more smooth uh, you know, enter and, and exit on site and, and everything in between. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. And I think that's the same with the team in, in C3. We can't see uh, any reason why almost all of the guys uh, in our current client base could use it. Plus anybody who's out there that, that needs a 
driver application that bolts onto a dock scheduling or yard management application. So yeah, watch this space. It's going to be very cool. Yeah, I love that because not only are you helping your the those uh, yard manager operators, et cetera, right? But you're also helping the drivers. So kill two birds with one stone. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. I, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Where can people go to learn more about C3? So c3solutions.com is our website. Um, and you can see tons of really, really cool things. We also have a channel on YouTube. Um, so yeah, we have some really, really amazing marketing on there. Some great insights, white papers, um, e- e-books, blogs. Uh, and you know, if you want to talk to somebody in sales, there's a, a way to do that. And we could show you a demo. Uh, even if you're a very early stage of your research, I think it'd be good to sort of whet the appetite and see what's available. Um, yeah, uh, we'd, we'd love to speak to you because we're so excited about the opportunity that this uh, new product and our existing products could, you know, mean to a, uh, a logistics company uh, who just want to improve their, their overall process and then, you know, keep their staff focused on the important stuff like team management and not dealing with the, you know, uh, you know, small issues that uh, a system can kind of do in the in the background, you know. Definitely, especially with all the labor issues we're seeing in the industry. Might as well retain and keep some happy uh, workers too. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. We'll, we'll have you on the show, I'm sure, in the future. And for our audience today, thank you so much for watching. Uh, of course, go check out the show. Sign up for our newsletter at brainwaves.com slash POS. And other than that, I will talk to you all next week. <laughs> Wow, I'm going to go to the bathroom.